Greetings everyone and welcome to TNO The Losses of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, and today we begin our trek playing as the Italian Empire. Now I've already set everything off screen, in which we have our military already figured out, all the divisions are placed around, I'm forming the navy already so we don't have to worry about that, and our planes, they're looking good as well. But, let's begin with the focus. We already have done the session XX, XXX3 of the Grand Council, so that's 33, so... The year of our Lord, 1962. Very cool. But now we must choose uh, Imperio, or Forza, and or Securiza. Now, I'll be honest, I can't remember which way. I remember that people want me to go down, whether we want to go more fascist or more democratic. So, reforms can wait. Prepare a special committee. We're going to do Imperio. Italy currently boasts the world's fourth largest economy, and its vast empire and sphere of influence spans over three continents. A focus on proper foreign policy, which in the past has been neglected in favor of the pursuit of autarky, as is now necessary to mend the various issues that plague the empire and its subjects. Deals with foreign powers, rework relationships with vassal states, and increase integration into the empire are just some of the problems that have to be addressed to achieve the prosperity we deserve. Absolutely. And I've already set up a lot of things here. Technology. I've already uh, done the budget stuff. We're looking pretty good, actually. We're only 44 billion in terms of debt, 80 billion in terms of GDP, but our growth is not very good. But dealing with the empire, at the being at the helm of the empire is sometimes not as great as it's made out to be. Something that the Italian government soon discovered not long after the end of the high that followed the victory in World War II, when the Italian Empire steadily expanded or expanding to include many more territories and protected states. Numerous problems quickly arose, mostly due to unending partisan activity, resistance from subject people, and a slow recovery from the devastation of the war. Atlanthropa only made things worse, wrecking the economy of numerous nations and forcing Mediterranean trade to be funneled across Suez, the lifeline of the empire. In such a situation, even the most staunch of conservatives can see the writing on the wall and be convinced that some form of action is needed, especially to amend the poor trade situation and to strengthen the empire in general. The Duce has proposed a series of radical changes to the administrative and economic realities of our great empire, and no doubt change shall come. Hopeful, hopefully it's change for the best. Also, we're led by Galeonzo Ciano. Oh boy. And we'll talk about the National Spirit soon. What is this? And I'll be honest, I haven't tried this off screen at all. Like, I don't know what's going on. Oh no. Oh no. Modifiers, influence of the Italian Empire. I have, a, I have a good feeling that Croatia and or Serbia might be a little bit of a problem, so. Uh, Bulgaria, Romania, National Salvation, Hungary. A lot of these will be having the great game with Germany, so I'm not too worried about that. I really don't know which one we want to go with. Fascism or more authoritarian democracy? 40 years of fascism. Hmm. Japanese cooperation, potential in India. Let's do Imperial Renewal. Our empire is currently a patchwork of directly governed territories such as Montenegro and Albania, military governorates such as the Levant, puppet states such as Croatia and Egypt, allies and friendly regimes such as Arabian monarchies, and even a vice royalty, the Italian East Africa. Therefore, it should be no surprise that such a vast empire is somewhat disjointed. However, we should focus on improving economic and political integration between the various territories under our control. Building more infrastructure, encouraging political reforms, and investing in more underdeveloped parts of the empire are just some of the things that we can do to move closer to achieving a status truly worth the name of. Pax Romana. Also, I guess I'm not making any divisions. I did forget something here. Making divisions. Uh, I didn't actually take a look at this yet. Uh, ooh, uh, that's, uh, hmm. Oh, I've got to add a lot of this stuff. Do we lose any army XP? We do not, which is a good thing. Division Colonial, that is big sadness. Let's make four divisions. That'll be fine. Apparently, we're out of guns. Oh, yeah. Not great. Not great. And what do we have over here, actually? Empire management expendable points? Oh. So the Italian Eagle is one that stretches proudly from the slopes of Kilimanjaro to the harsh colds of the Alps, having conquered for itself a massive and wealthy empire through the carnage of two world wars. Without her domains, Italy would sink back to being a secondary power, however, for as great as mighty as empire is, it certainly spread itself thin. Budget drains, garrison issues, and many more have hindered its ability to exert force, let alone if expand. If not patched, these cracks will only grow. Oh, delegates, delegates, delegates. Oh boy. The best of enemies. Oh boy. But let's read about the Imperial Renewal first. A new round of meetings is set to take place in the Italian capital, as representatives from the local governments of several Italian puppet states and imperial dependencies have gathered to push for new policies to be implemented across the empire. Delegates from Egypt, led by Commissar Italo Balbo, together with the generals from governorates of the Levant, a small crowd of politicians, and even at natives, representatives from the Italian East Africa, all convened in Rome, with each hoping to receive reforms and changes brought about for their slice of the empire. The path to further cooperation and integration among the various parts of the empire won't be an easy one, as contrasting interests and Requests for autonomy or more autonomy make this endeavor a political nightmare. However, 
Important concessions have already been made by Rome as Siano uh, renewed promises to increase political autonomy for states under Italian protections and to loosen the hold that the Italian armed forces have over territories like the Levant. Perhaps the Imperial Dream isn't dead? We'll see what happens. The Balkan Initiative. And military dominance in Libya. I would like more stability. Algerian summit. The situation in Algeria is, to put it simply, a complete mess. Pied Noir militias, native insurgent groups, and settler defense groups all fight over the territory and oil producing regions. At the same time, the whole country is normally still part of the French state in recent years. Algeria became the theater of low intensity warfare between these different groups, and the steady advance of the Iberian soldiers and settlers into their territory is rapidly becoming a source of concern among both the Italian settlers and our military. We must immediately call a summit with Iberia to resolve the situation before it escalates. The bus of enemies. Since before World War II, the Italian armed forces have been split between a monarchist faction supporting King Vittorio Emmanuel and a fascist faction supporting Mussolini. With the war over, tensions between the two camps have begun to build up, with the monarchists gravitating more and more towards Siano and his reformist ideals, and the fascists looking for with favor towards Carlo Scorza. The two factions find their rallying points, <clears throat> respectively, in Edgardo Sogno, influential diplomat and former officer of the Reggio Esercito. And Junio Valerio Borghese, head of the legendary Decima Flotiglia Mas. Depending on the path Italy chooses to take, following an unfriendly faction to dominate the armed forces could have cat catastrophic results. Oh god, I don't know. And Casa el Mezzogiorno, southern Italy has always been a barren land, devoid of much of anything but the odd shipping port and many, many farms. Even in the early days of the 19th century, as the deltas of the north hummed alive with industrial activity, the south still acted the way it had centuries before. Now, this will all change, for Italy to be united. It must be in every sense, and that includes its economies, or economics. The Casa per el Mezzogiorno will ensure the fruits of the industrial revolution will spread fully through the south, for the benefit of the entire peninsula. Survey for a project? Uh, sure, we'll try that. And we're going to keep reading this, but the Algerian summit. A diplomats from Iberia and Italy have met in Palermo, Palermo to discuss the current situation in Algeria. <clears throat> Considering the extremely chaotic and complex situation that the region currently is in, the news that the summit ended without any serious accomplishment was taken with no surprise. The poorly defined and porous borders between the military administrations of the two respective countries have done very little to halt the passage of weapons, militias, and smuggled goods from one side to the other, and each country was happy to blame the other for that. Other points of contention included the support and armament of Pierre Noir's militias, mostly reunited under the Cité Catholique umbrella and organization led by Yves Guerin Serac by Iberia's military government. Iberian representatives responded by pointing out the rapid mafia activities in Italian controlled areas and the alleged support given by Italy to Algerian independence groups. Each side ended up denying the other's accusations, but it seems that what truly caused this heated climate was leaked reports from the ENI, the Italian oil company, suggesting that the Algerian region may be rich in oil deposits. With all these overlapping interests and the general instability of the area, many predict that an escalation might be inevitable. Is this yet another war on the horizon? Probably. Probably very much so. Ah, very good. Alright, well, the Balkan Initiative. Our hold on the Balkans is currently dependent on three things. First, there are several regions under our direct control, such as Montenegro, Albania, and Dalmazia, which in many cases are inhabited by non-Italian populations who have expressed discontent at our rule. Secondly, the Kingdom of Croatia, a nominally independent nation and factually puppet state, dealing with partisan insurgency and Ustase terrorism. Thirdly, Greece, a state barely holding itself together under the pressure of several well-armed and trained insurgent groups. The situation isn't exactly looking rosy, so addressing our Balkan woes is in order if we don't want that gosh darn peninsula turning into the spark that ignites yet another crisis. Despite being one of the victors of the last world war and the fourth greatest power, Italy still lacks a nu nuclear arsenal of her own, as it already th has thin resources which had to be spent on managing her vast empire. With the German threat ever looming across the Alps, it would be very wise to correct this situation as quickly as possible. Now that Italy's economy is finally starting to prosper again, we can finally invest into Progetto Alpha, an Italian military nuclear program, aimed at creating a proper atomic arsenal. We will have to choose carefully the head of our project, some will prioritize certain aspects over others, and some will even refuse to work for us out of political differences. Nevertheless, we should try to get the project completed as quickly as possible. It is much better to have nukes and, and not need them, rather than to need nukes and not have them. Oh god. Fund the project? Fire the current leader? We are working at a sluggish pace? He prioritizes optimization. This reminds me of the Gibraltar Dam if he plays Iberia, so. Ooh, optimization. Optimize everything? Well, let's fund the project. Reeling in Croatia. With the situation in Croatia becoming ever more worrisome, Siano has released a press statement regarding the possibility of a greater involvement of Italian forces in the region. While in the past, the Italian government has always presented its puppet state Croatia as a successful and prosperous country. Siano painted a grim picture of the real situation in the kingdom, setting the recent out recent rise in partisan activity and the ever-present threat of the Ustase. 
Croatia has enjoyed close ties to Italy since World War II, when an Italian king was placed on the throne of the newly created kingdom. However, it seems that soon the country might find itself occupied once again by Italian forces, intervening to shore up the kingdom against uncertain movements. This cannot end well. No, oh, we need a lot. Wow, we need a lot of steel. Actually, oh, yeah, I don't. Oh, hmm. Are we making. Oh, oh, we're still making stuff. It's not bad. We could use a lot more guns, though. Holy cow. I did not realize that. Rights for refugees. The situation regarding German refugees. Less stability, less political power. More monthly power gain, less monthly population. Better monthly poverty change. I like that. And we have segregation currently. I love segregation, but then we get equal rights. We actually lose more political power, potentially. More non core manpower. Let's do it. After World War II, Italy and our former German friends have started to drift apart more and more. As allies rapidly turned into bitter rivals. In the chaos that followed the economic crash of the 50s, a wave of refugees coming from Germany, mainly Jews and uh, members of other ethnic minorities, made their way to Italy to escape Nazi oppression. Many of them were resettled in the new Adriatic lands reclaimed by Anthropa, and have lived there since. While these communities have ra integrated rather well into Italian society, they still lack numerous fundamental rights granted to Italian citizens. We should move towards giving them equality and rights to these men and women so that they too become children of Rome. Sergut. Actually, can we do anything like this? So, we can fire the current leader. Uh, I'm kind of okay with that for now. Ente Nacional Hidrocarburi. Born as a small state-owned <clears throat> state owned oil company in the 30s, over the decades, the Anta Nacional uh, Hidrocarburi rose to prominence under the guidance of Enrico Mattai, eventually becoming the largest oil company in the world, entirely owned by the Italian state. ENI is today the economic cornerstone of the Italian Empire, exploiting the vast oil reserves of the numerous countries in Italy's sphere. Investing into the ENI is crucial to keep the oil flowing and the Italian economy afloat. However, given the large amounts of resources necessary to increase the ENI operations, investments should be pondered carefully. Albania, Transjordan, unknown reserves in a lot of different places, Kuwait is currently being developed, but oh my god. Gosh, if I don't do this correctly, we could probably end up having a crisis. Some might call it an oil crisis. Oh boy, this is looking crazy. The situation regarding German refugees in the last decade, the political relationship between the former Axis powers of Europe, Germany, and Italy soured to the point of no return and turned the two allies into bitter rivals. When the economic crisis rocked the German sphere, Italy also suffered, but certainly not as much as its northern neighbor. Thus, Italy became a natural destination for the thousands of refugees that sought escape from the Nazi persecution and terror, seizing their chance to fl flee the grasp of Germania in the case of the West Russian War and the economic crash. Numerous Jews, Roma, Sinti, and even other persecuted groups such as homosexuals fled towards Italy, hoping to find a refugee refuge in a country that, while so fascist, was much more lenient than the Reich towards discriminated groups. The then Minister of Foreign Affairs and now Duce Galezo Siano was supportive of Mussolini's decision to give refugees a refuge to escaping masses, and many of them were dispersed across the vast reaches of the empire. However, many still live in refugee camps and temporary structures, many of them located in the reclaimed lands of the, of the, of the Adriatic. The Duce has signed an order allocating resources to encourage integration, and an eventual path to citizenship for the German refugees in order to turn them from a burden on the back of the estate into a valuable asset for our empire. The Roman Empire was all about assimilation and integration, after all. End Military Dominance of Libya The territories of Libya were annexed to the Metropolitan Kingdom of Italy in 1934, under the leadership of Governor Italo Balbo. Ever since then, the indigenous Arabs who inhabit Libya have been granted the status of Italian Libyan citizens, which gives them a legal status identical to, th to the Italians. However, this legal status is only valid as long as they reside in Libya. Outside of it, they are simply colonial subjects of the crown. The Muslim population of Libya has proven their loyalty to us time and again. We believe it's time to remove these restrictions and grant the Libyan Arabs the full status of Italian citizenry. Oh boy. And I'll be honest, like, even though we're reading a lot right here, um, oh, I, I still don't know which way we should go democratic or more fascist. I think it was recommended that, for my Discord server, that we should go more fascist, actually. Regardless of the way we go, I will play Italy twice eventually. One time going towards more very demo democratic path and one time towards more fascist path, so we'll see what happens. The integration of Libya. In a historic turn of events, all the barriers left between Italians and Libyans were torn down by Siano's signature, as a new law was approved fi finally granting Libyans with Italian citizenship. Siano announced that this decision by condemning mistakes committed by Italy in the past regarding the Libyan population, referencing the infamous massacres committed in Cyrenaica in the 1920s, while at the same time ex uh, expressing his hope that this reform is the last act of decades-long integration of Libya within Italy. With the Italian and Arab populations having lived largely in peace for about two decades now, this new law recognizes the de facto assimilation of the native pop Muslim population into the Italian administrative unity. Public opinion has been mixed about this new development, but the Libyan pop public opinion generally proved the elimination of one last bureaucratic hurdle that kept them from being considered full Italian citizens. However, many wonder if this truly is enough to contain autonomous and independent movements from being active in the region, or this decision might backfire in the future. At least it should, for now. 
Croatia Utase. After Yugoslavia was invaded by the Axis forces in World War II, the independent state of Croatia was established as a kingdom in the Italian sphere of influence, with Alumini di Savoia Astoa ruling as King Tomislav II. However, the real power in the country was the hands of the Utase. Ustase, a fascist and ultra-nationalist party and paramilitary known for its brutality against Serbs and other ethno-religious minorities. The leader of the Ustase, and Ante Pavelic, died in 1959, which allowed us to intervene more directly in Croatia and sidelining the Ustase more and more, to the point that they have turned against us and are now waging a guerrilla war against the kingdom. We must quickly move more resources and men to Croatia to crush the Ustase and its fanatical po followers before they grow too powerful. Obviously, I'm saying that we're wrong. Ustase? Ustasi? Usti? Usti? Test our work? Well, maybe, oh, maybe that's a bad idea. Maybe we should not test our work. Oh, boy. That's probably a bad idea. Assassin strikes Hitler. Well, house divided. Goodbye, Hitler. Well, within a year. Operation Thralista. The international press is reporting that troops of the Croatian Kingdom, aided by Italian advisors and reinforcements, have begun to carry out Operation Thral... Thralista, a countrywide military police operation aimed at arresting prominent people associated with or part of the Ustase and eliminating their holdouts in rural areas of the country. <clears throat> In urban areas, the operation sometimes resulted in guerrilla warfare as Ustase supporters were informed about the operation in advance and fought back against the soldiers who came to apprehend them. In rural areas, the situation was, situation was much worse. Heavy fighting has been reported in mountainous regions in which Ustase mil paramilitary groups still control a few hamlets and villages, many of which were either besieged and conquered by after brutal combat or simply bombed into dust by Italian art artillery fire. Overall, it is difficult to gauge exactly how Trolista has actually weakened the Ustase. While many members of the paramilitary organization have been either arrested or killed, numerous important figures of the organization including its de facto leader, Jules Frenetchek, seeming to have vanished into thin air, escaping the grasp of Italian and Croatian forces. Hopefully this will be enough to stop those fanatics. Probably not, and Croatian center stage, or Croatia. Croatia is quickly revealing itself to be the weak spot in her empire, with the Ustase bot becoming an ever greater threat, and the Zavno partisans getting stronger with every passing day. The situation might quickly slip out of control if we don't immediately intervene. The autonomy and independence granted to the Croatian government will be further reduced, declaring a state of national emergency and giving supreme power to the cadre of Italian generals and advisors surrounding the King Tomislav. Tomislav. An empire is not too different from its chain, and uh, Croatia is its weakest link. We cannot allow it to break. What can we do here? Fire the current leader? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Oh, actually. Spend more construction. Spend, 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 spend. I don't spend as much as we can. Long term, oh, short term pain in terms of budget, long term gain in terms of budget and GDP. Uh, we'll be trying to slash down the debt. Operation Teuta. At midnight of yesterday, Italian troops deployed along the border with Croatia have launched Operation Teuta. Italian armored columns and troops have marched into Croatia, advancing into the kingdom's territory to bolster their already existing garrisons in several major cities, as well as set up new bases deep in the countryside and the mountains of the country. According to the first reports, any parts and operations have already started, with sparse fighting in the hills of the interior. The major target of the Operation Harvest Hill seems to be the final eradication of the Ustase from the country. International media has called Operation Teuta a second invasion of Croatia, and in any pretense the country has any sort of autonomy or sovereignty is now lost. Everyone can plainly see that Croatian Kingdom is a de facto and Italian military administration, currently struggling to contain its numerous opponents. Italian public opinion has been critical of this new development, as many fail to see the benefit of yet another campaign of repression that will surely result in numerous Italian lives being wasted. It might be the only situation or solution to this mess, and we have a new operative. A demolition expert? Politically connected? Ooh. Natural orator. Hmm, let's go with Anna. Potential in India. Since the uh, 19th century, our foreign and colonial pol policies always had an eastern direction, with their two earliest colonies, Somalia and Eritrea, located on the shores of the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, respectively. Therefore, it's only natural that we seek closer trade deals and relationships with India, as this won't allow us won't only allow us to find new profitable markets to sell our products to, but also reinforce our geopolitical presence in the Indian Ocean. Very good. Hitler names Bowman as, as a successor. More of the same, it would seem... Very much so. And actually, can we help put down resistance immediately? Do we have resistance maybe in northern Albania? Maybe down here? Um, no, 0% resistance looks pretty good. Just in case. Actually, Italian Empire... Do you guys have a focus tree? No, boy, it looks ha fat and happy. Farouk the first. Ah, uh, how about you guys? No? Okay. Yemen. Ah, uh, Yemen. Iraq is under us. Ah, look how happy he is. But, Indian trade. After left open the collapse of our relationship with Germany, the Italian Empire was left star for trade, while the formation of the Triumvirate has ameliorated these issues to an extent. More trade relations with other countries can't hurt our country. To this end, our diplomats have entered talks recently with the Republic of India, a natural trade partner in the Indian Ocean, in an attempt to increase trade between our two nations. 
It seems that our efforts have borne fruit, as the Indian government has agreed to sign a trade agreement between our two great nations, which will surely improve our trade issues. Another step in the long road towards economic recovery. Uh, democracy can work? Maybe. Despite having recently gained its independence from the British oppressors, India appears to be a relatively stable and rapidly growing state. Some in Italy say that this has happened despite its democratic and unpopular government. Still, many are starting to think that India's newfound prosperity and stability is actually a result of a well-managed democracy. As goods and people pass through our Indian Ocean ports in ever greater quantities, ideas are starting to pass through as well. Having a friendly and powerful de democratic ally will surely do no good for the fascist cause in Italy. Which is fine, you know, I want to get through all the focuses before we do too much. I still think for this campaign, we, I want to go probably more fascist. We'll see what that We'll see. Oh, look. Cro oh, actually, this did affect this. Croatia is more reliant on the Italian Empire. The Hellenic state is still more reliant on the Italian Empire as well. Good. The Indian system. Italy and India. The two I countries. Had never been particularly close as isolation reinforced by distance and opposed politics. Still, in some ways, India is not too distant from us. They are a secondary power with few friends and many enemies. Despite this, we have still both stood tall in a hostile world. We are not as powerful as the Reich of Japan, but we are still forced to be reckoned with. However, much to the chagrin of many fascists here in Italy, they are not fascists. The intellectual basis for the continuation of the fascist regime is that a relatively isolated power such as ourselves can only stay alive through a strong, ordered nation, casting away pretensions such as individualism and democracy as detrimental to the ultimate goal. India, in contrast, holds free elections, a lack of corporatist economy, and is not culturally constructed around a staunch sense of nationalism, yet somehow they are powerful. And Nehru's government is quite stable, on par with us and on par with the world. How could this be? Perhaps men are not tired of liberty. Open up the Indian Ocean trade. Oh, open up the Indian Ocean. Many of the parts of the archaic and protectionist restrictions put in place in foreign trade before World War II are still present and are a hindrance to the profit of commerce in the Indian Ocean by creating new bureaucratic and legal frameworks to allow free commerce and movements of goods and people in the Indian Ocean, as well as further investing into the infrastructure. We can turn our eastern ports such as Mogadishu, Dubai, and Assab into international maritime trade hubs that will make our vast empire even more profitable. Man, with this campaign, I know I'm going to get really very Italian here. Or as Italian, American Italian as I could possibly be. Hold, hold on. This is the first time I ever realized that the Principality of Monaco exists, led by some wild woman. Is that a woman? I think it's a woman. Yeah, it's a princess. So it should be a woman, right? Italian oversight. I When did Monaco get added to Tino? Was it always there? That's so small. Then again, I guess San Marino's here too. Dalla Chiesa. Chiesa requests more men. What are you going to do with those men? Well, we got to read that. And also we have... The Pope. Oh, where's the Pope? No, not there, but it's the Pope. Pope John the 20... Was it 3rd? 23rd. Oh, boy. Lateran Pax. One holy Catholic divided church. Okay, divided. That's always good to be. All right, so Governor Dalla Chiesa. Oh, the Levant has put in an official request for additional challenging troops to re reinforce his own garrison, citing rebel activity, trade security, and increasing common Turkish border patrols. The governor claims that the town's support is vital for the continued stability of the empire. Greater involvement in the Levant would, of course, provide control and authority in the region, especially in the opposition to the Turkish government, which has become increasingly aggressive as relations have declined. However, committing forces to defend the Levant would be leave less flexibility in imperial policy. The safety of the empire, as always, rests in the Duce's capable hands. Commitment will become zero. A token force. One can never be too careful. You know, I'm kind of interested in playing as Turkey someday, but we gotta wait. Weakening grip, huh? Economic stagnation. Um, for now, we can enjoy the Triumvirate. I love the Triumvirate. But, whatever, you know, it is what it is. Oh, Serbia's part of the Iron Hats pack. I didn't realize that. But yeah. Oh, Indian Ocean Wind. <clears throat> Chairman Matai looked out from the windows of the ENI's headquarters building in Dubai, a modern, shiny building made of glass and steel, but still somewhat influenced by the rational style of typical fascist architecture. From his office, he could enjoy a eagle's view over Dubai's port, and there he saw a large ship from which many men, not too dissimilar from ants at this distance, slowly disembarked one by one. The first ship of workers from India had arrived. Dubai is a strange place, envisioned by the fascist leadership as a shining city in the desert. Built as a pet project to rival Alanthropa, it rapidly, rapidly became a fiefdom of ENI when staggering amounts of oil were discovered in the area. Fueled by the oil fever, Dubai kept growing and expanding oil and naval industries are ever thirsty for more manpower. Thanks to the new trade deals between Italy and India, new and marvelous opportuni opportunities of profit will be realized in Dubai, much to the benefit of both of our great nations. Gentlemen, welcome to Dubai. Japanese cooperation, while the old Axis alliance is no more and relationship with Germany has gone downhill since the drain, or down the drain since World War II. We've always been much friendlier with Japan. As natural trade partners in the Indian Ocean, Italy and Japan have always enjoyed good relationships and good trade, but there's certainly more we can do to bring our two great countries ever closer. Uh, I will say this, like, I, I'm sure I said this before, but Italy was actually the first nation I wanted to play as when I started playing TNO, so... Yeah, we'll see what happens. I really wanted to play as Italy, first of all, just because I thought there wasn't too many campaigns. Also, I do want to let you know, I'm playing on the, for TNO, cutting room floor 
patch F at the time of this recording. So, just to let you guys know. Oh, and I have a pause still. I wonder why the game wasn't going. Research-wise, we're looking pretty good. So, and we're actually going down the strate Strategic Theorem Doctrine. Trade deals with Japan. To the east, the ocean gleams, shining with opportunity. While our relationships with Germany might have gone sour, our friendship with Japan is still as strong as it was when the Tripartite Act was first signed in 1940, despite the recent and troublesome events that shook the two great empires. The most natural solution to reinvigorate our economy would be a renewed trade compact with Japan, allowing us to exchange oil and manufacture goods for cheap resources extracted in the sphere, which will serve to fuel our industrial expansion. A team of diplomats, including representatives, representatives of ENI, handpicked by Enrico Mattia, started to negotiate the exact terms of these accords with the representatives of the Rising Sun, and it seems that an official visit by the Japanese Prime Minister, Ino, is going to take place in Rome soon. Trust of friends are always nice to have. Very, very good. Oh, now we must do Italio... Italo, Italo, Japanese partnership. The economies of Japan and Italy are com extremely compatible with one another, as the Italians can offer them massive amounts of oil in exchange for Japanese manufactured goods and raw materials from the sphere and nations. By signing closer trade deals, we can increase the volume of goods moved between our respective sides of the Indian Ocean, therefore increasing our profit margins and the amount of money we'll be able to invest in our empire. More trade is always good for us, and we have more than enough oil to spare. Which is why I'm trying to train my ships. And planes. Oh, look at that naval XP looking so good now. Oh, Roman evenings. The sun sets over the Rome and its rays playing with the branches of the cypress trees that line the Alpi Appian Way. The cobblestone road seems to stretch eternally in the hills that surround the city as it once did when Roman legionaries, merchants, peasants, and emperors walked alongside it. Now the Appia Antica is much more quiet and only two people are walking on it, quietly talking in perfect French. The language of diplomacy, after all the fanfare, the politics, and the crowds, the Duce proposed a tranquil walk among the Roman ruins of the Appian Way to conclude the last day of the Japanese Prime Minister Hiro Ino's official state visit to the Italian capital. As the sound of his cicadas it is heard faintly in the background, Siano and Ino find themselves more and more involved in the informal conversation which started from personal themes such as taste in music and theater, but rapidly took much more melancholic undertones. As the first stars begin to appear in the evening sky, two men realize more and more that perhaps, even if separated by oceans and continents, they're not much different from each other. The burden of ruling an empire on the brink of catastrophe, threatened by outside enemies and torn by internal fights, the extenuating task of being forced to commit ever more morally dubious acts of real politique, the ever-present terror of the possibility that in the end it was all for nothing. Such things cannot be easily shared, but perhaps that in that Roman sunset, as the cicadas sung, two men found some peace, even if it was just for a passing moment. Sometimes one needs to put things into perspective. Unlikely friends. As a result of the renewed Italian-Japanese partnership, Japanese Prime Minister Hiroya Ino has been invited on an official state visit to Rome. Galezzo Siano is quite the charmer, and he's already preparing to make sure that the state visit goes as smoothly as it could. The most refined, entertaining, and most exquisite food, the most sublime music, the most elegant dresses, and a glass of our best wine accompany it all. Considering that the Duce is famously well-spoken and cultured man, so it wouldn't be surprising if a genuine friendship blossoms between Siano and his Japanese counterparts. Very good. And we're still in February 1962. Ah, the first enemy has been defeated. Very good. Nagasaki Trade Compact. A new commercial agreement was signed today in Nagasaki by Italian diplomats and representatives from Japan, Manchuria, China, Guangdong, and several other nations in the cold prosperity sphere. Perhaps an event not attracting as much attention as the naval exercises or the state visits, it, however, far exceeds them in importance. Both nations stand to benefit from the new trade compact, as it allows freer circulation of goods and capital in the Indian Ocean, thus linking the bottom resources possessed by the two empires. Here's to profit. Common interest. The Regia, Marina, and the Imperial Japanese Navy are the two most fearsome fleets that now sail the world's wide oceans in their respective spheres of influence and compasses opposite sides of the Italian Ocean, or Indian Ocean. Well, it's going to be an Italian Ocean eventually. By working together, these mighty navies can ensure peace and order in the Indian Ocean by stepping up piracy and policing the high seas. As a sign of friendship, the Regia, Marina, and IGN will conduct joint military exercises drills exercises and drills. Not only will it take, strike fear into the hearts of our enemies, but it will also give us important insight on how the world's foremost naval superpower mer manages and merges its navy. So not bad, even when we increase construction. How are we looking? Not bad. We only have 68 civilian factories. And our success with Japan. An Italian ship sails into the port of Tokyo. Its deck, on its decks are hundreds of containers. Some carry the goods that are famously Italian, wine, motors, scooters, and the like. In others, machine parts and grain. Only a few hundred meters away, barrels of oil piped out of Italian tinkers. Italian oil extracted from North Africa now fuels the Japanese army from Manchuria to Bengal, offsetting the need to exploit the relatively limited spheres. Spheres reserves. But the success does not stop here. No, it goes far further. Italian ties and suits fly off the shelf and... 
Mitsukoshi department store as Italian cinema dominates Japanese theaters and Italian or Italy fever has seemed to have swept Japan. It surely will not last, but it proves just how quickly our new friendship has come together. Still, the most important effects of our new success is the cash that returns to Italy to Italian artisans and Italian manufacturers. This new cash will help in the rejuvenation of our economy and will help propel us into an Italian century. Salute! Delegation to Tokyo. With a newfound partnership with Japan, our diplomats is there, spearheaded by industrialist and ambassador Antore Conti, have proposed the creation of a permanent economic or Italian economic delegation in Tokyo. This delegation will be led by the board of Italian business and finance representatives that will act as our beachhead into uh, Italian commerce and finance, keeping ties with the representatives of the Japanese government and the various zaibatsus, allowing us to tie our economy even closer to that of the co-prosperity sphere. Tokyo and Rome are on the opposite side of the globe, but they're ne they've never been so close. The impact of the endeavor won't be immediately be apparent. Oh boy, is this a bad idea? The Great Bulgarian Game. In Bulgaria, since the closing days of the Second World War, has been closely linked to the Germany Inner Pact. This wasn't an issue for Bulgaria and was even profitable for the two in nearly a decade. The great market crash of the 50s changed everything, however. So closely tied to the German economy, it was only natural that the Bulgarian markets followed suit. Bulgaria very nearly left the pact. The Germans, exerting the rest of their influence that they had in the region, managed to threaten, bribe, and call in enough favors to pack the Bulgarian administration with pro German ministers. To keep the government under close watch, the Germans shortly after deployed a garrison to Sofia itself to keep the peace during the turmoil. Ten years later, then one still sees German boots patrolling the capital. Perhaps times are changing, however. The Bulgarian government is perhaps ripe to be overthrown. Prime Minister Gabrovsky, well known to be in German hands, recently died in a car accident. Rumor surrounds his death, but whatever, whether he was assassinated or truly did die in a tragic accident means nothing. His death has given the underground fatherland front the hope they need to begin acting against pro-German elements in the country. As Italian influences attempt to take snake their way into the country, the Rikers began to crack down on what they see as dissent activity. Only time will tell what the results, or what will result from the two meddling in Bulgaria, and so the great game has begun. We start with seven, they have six. Oh, the Germans. Oh, we need political power, which we don't have. We need support equipment, which we don't have. And we need infantry equipment, which we don't have. I'm going to go with the... Uh, ooh. Ooh, I do want a lot of at uh, attack helicopters and transport, so... But for now, we must do what we must do. Let's get some more guns and support equipment. I think that would be ideal. Do that. Uh, yeah, that sucks. That really sucks that we can't do all this stuff, but it's fine. Ah, and the Italian delegation sent to Tokyo. In a newly constructed building in the Bunkyo Ward of Tokyo, the Italian economic delegation has finally set up shop. The culmination of the new trade deals recently undertook by Italy with Japan. The delegation will serve as a board of businessmen and industrialists, keeping contacts and renewed deals with Japanese Zaibatsus and Karatsus, much to the advantage of the Italian businesses selling and buying up the, the area. Representatives of the ENI, Olivetti, Finn Makanyaka, and even relatively minor ones like Ferrari, will now have a direct link with the Far East, allowing the Italian government to reap the benefits of trans. Transoceanic trade, Kanpai. Cool. So now I have to make a decision, in which I'm sure I'm not. I'm going to upset some people, and I'm not going to upset some people. And actually, people are going to welcome this. So we do Forza or Sicurzia. Well, I think for this campaign, like I said earlier, I think I'm going to go the fascist route, just because. Why not? I'll play the democratic route later on. That seems like a little bit more fun if you want to improve your economy, but we're going to go with Securizia. Our brave soldiers have won Italy, the empire she deserved, our place in the sun, but maintaining an empire under control isn't easy all over. Subversives, uh, terrorists, and insurgents have threatened the peace that we have established in the Mediterranean. We must act to ensure that nobody can dare to threaten our hold of the mayor Nostrum, unless we wish to see the empire that we have endured so many hardships to fall into anarchy. This is a line espoused by Carlos Scorza, secretary of the PFN, or PF, PNF which the current Dolce was strong-armed into adopting to avoid risking a rebellion from within his own party. It's hard to say how much of this new policy will affect reality, but observers from the nations of the Italian sphere does, don't seem too pleased. And if we go down this route, this, sounds, this seems like it might bode well for us, especially when we try to, you know, mingle with Japan. Relative of bygone era. It was a clear morning in Genoa when the crowd gathering in front of the dockyards on stage before them, Podesta Vittorio Peruzio stood surveilling his audience. Those assembled before him were dressed in a mournful black and gray at the clothes of a funeral, fitting it was for it was a funeral for that Peruzio would conduct. Behind him stood a rusting dockyard, the last part of Genoa's pride that the city hadn't scuttled yet, and behind that stretched endless wind-swept salt flats. The gift of Adlanthropa, seeing that the square was filled to capacity, per Portusio begins eulogy of the Genoese port. 
From its beginning, Genoa was a city of the sea. Its port had transformed it from a small town in the coast to a thriving hub of commerce for centuries. Genoese sailors had ruled from, from the Mediterranean, trading from Constantinople to Malacca, and it was only the rise in Atlantic trade that reduced its prominence. However, this would not be the end of Genoa's maritime activities for following the unification of Italy. Genoa becomes a major trading port. From its dockyards were built some of the most beautiful ships to ever sail the seven seas, a titan such as the SS Achilia and MS Augustus. But then the Atlantic returned with vengeance to put down Genoa seafaring, this time forever. As Pertusio finished his narration, he looked up and noticed the eyes of tens of thousands upon him. As he watched, he stepped forward to place his hands upon the de detonator and, with a heavy heart, press a button upon it. An enormous crack ringed the air as the last dry dock of Genoa exploded, the shockwave being felt even from his distance. As the last piece of the debris settled, silence reigned. Then the crowd surely want slowly wandered back home, having witnessed the end of an era. Later that day, following a preliminary meeting by city officials on how to move forward, Pertusio languished in his office, having ingested more than enough servings of... Pedamontese wine. As the minutes passed, his anger and conviction grew further and further until they reached the breaking point. In a drunken rage, he tore off his PNF pin and threw it into the fireplace. Watching the accursed symbol turn to ashes, he knew now knew what he must do. The next morning, he sent his letter of resignation to the local PNF headquarters. The Italians loved to blame the Germans for their misfortunes, but it was Mussolini's repulsive ideology that got him into this mess in the first place. Pertusio has never been a friend of fascism, but he can no longer pretend to care about it to serve Italy. If he was ever to serve in office, it would have to be under a government truly other people, like the Democrats of decades past. And thus, fascism claimed another victim. The Secretary's Congress, Session XXX333, or actually that should be 33, of the Grand Council of Fascism has started at Palazzo della Farnesina in Rome, as journalists and policemen swarmed around politicians and ministers entering the austere rationalist building. In a political power move that left many shocked, it seemed that the secret Secretary of the PNF, Carlo Scorza, has strong-armed Siano to let him speak before the Congress almost as much as the Duce himself. After a small introductory address by Siano, it was Carlos Scorza who took the floor. Such a development is quite telling of the influence and power that Scorza has reached within the fascist government. There are many rumors circulating about Scorza's true aims and goals, but only the thing the only thing that is certain is that now someone is directing th directly threatening Siano's power over the PNF. A lowly secretary upstanding the Duce? Preposterous. Reforms can wait with the countries that situations still threatened by subversive elements and the various puppet states and colonies that make up our empire still widely unstable. This doesn't exactly seem like the best possible time for reforms and liberalization. Maintaining an empire is not an easy task, and thus we must utilize all the proper tools for the job. After all, the censorship laws, OFRA, and the special tribunals for enemies of the state were created for a reason. So, National Spirit's declining trade. Wow, that looks really bad. That's really, really bad. We even have plus 55% justify war goals times, we can't even justify, and we're already penalized. Tensions in the council, the contradictions between the party, or the different party lines in the PNF have become intensely apparent today. As Siano's attempts to introduce reformist plans have bogged down, faced by a fierce opposition from Scorza and his faction rapidly, the situation devolved into bickering and arguing in circles. After sunset, everyone left Palazzo della Farnesina, dissatisfaction and anger are visible in every politician's face. Situa situation seems to become more worrying by the day, as Siano's position is becoming increasingly precarious. Scores has been seen talking with numerous important Gracchi, as his political maneuvering is becoming more and more blatant. International observers are starting to become concerned that the political situation in Italy might take a sudden shift in the near future. I don't like where this is going. Well, some of us do. Uh, Garrison of Greece, remind the king. Currently, the Reggio Esercito, the Reggio Marina, and the other branches of our mighty armed forces are scattered across the empire, either ensuring our domain's peace and security or propping up and supporting the militaries of our allies and vassal states. However, from all the corners of the Mare Nostrum, our brave men in uniform cry out that they need more men and resources to carry out their duties. Therefore, we must reinforce and strengthen our garrisons and armies across the whole Mediterranean to ensure that no one can threaten the Pax Romana. Next one is Fading Fascism, which doesn't look good for us, as well as Ascendant Navy, which is not great. Really not great, but it, it works for now. So Carlos scores has managed to score yet another victory in the council by managing to strong arm the Duce into sending out more garrisons to the puppet states of the empire. In particular, Greece is a constant source of concern as several partisans and insurgent groups still control large parts of the mountainous interior of the country. A proper anti-partisan campaign to get rid of the rebels will be too costly and difficult to carry out, but we can strengthen our hold of the major cities like Athens and Thessalonica. By sending more men and resources there. Already Italian troops and armored vehicles are embarking for Greece, and the garrisons there already have received orders to bolster their defensive positions. Gozamani's 
government might be shaky, but with the troops acting as a stabilizing force, everything should go smoothly. Everything is under control, but we must remind the king. His Imperial and Royal Majesty Umberto II, by the grace of God and the will of the nation, King of Italy and Albania, Emperor of Ethiopia, First Marshal of the Empire, is a man with numerous grandiose titles but little real weight in politics. Italian kings have rarely directly meddled, directly meddled with the kingdom's political troubles, and Umberto II is no exception, and soon preparing to act as a symbolic figurehead. However, with the Verona Congress now appearing on the horizon, it would be a wise to involve the king in drawing up some emergency fallback plans in case something in Verona goes horribly wrong. We express a Congress to proclaim or proceed in an orderly and calm fashion, but perhaps one can never be too cautious. And we do have King Umberto, of course, as well. We get less political power, but he does give us uh, some stability in exchange. Siano meets with Umberto II. Today, His Excellency the Duce and Prime Minister of Italy, Galeazzo Siano, has met with His Royal Highness King Umberto II in the latter's Roman residence, the Palazzo del Quirinal. The talks between the two have been largely kept secret from the media, but many speculate that Siano is trying to seek the king's support in his political schemes, what's particularly attractive for the media in the upcoming Verona Congress. Scheduled to take place in a few months from now, the two are natural political enemies, or allies actually, they're political allies, as many of the hardline fascists opposed to Siano's reforms also call for the abolition of the monarchy. The first National Congress of the PNF during Siano's reign as Duce, the Congress will take place in the Venetian city, famed as a setting of Romeo and Juliet. Like in the Shakespearean tragedy, Verona will be the battlefield of two angry opposing factions, with Scarzo, Scarzo, Carlo Scorza growing ever more powerful and respected in Italy's political apparatus, and the loyalty of the army and the black shirts uncertain. It can only be hoped that the senseless tragedy portended by the play will not come to pass. King Umberto is well known for his shyness regarding politics, so it's hard to predict what actions he will take, if any at all. However, with a political storm like likely approaching on the horizon, many look towards the crown as a stabilizing factor, one which the nation will hopefully not need. At a time like when many had written off about the whims and wants of the monarchs as relative to the forgotten age, it seems that royalty still has a little kick left in it. Long live the king. The Road to Order Italy has managed to su succeed where most others in history have failed, creating a lasting peace in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Such a peace could only be achieved through might to the might of our armed forces. If we renounce our walls, peacekeepers, and guardians of order in our empire, we will undo all of our past efforts. Those who must reinforce our hold over the empire's far reaches, from Algeria to Oman, to ensure that the Roman dream of Mussolini and fascism doesn't disappear like sand in the wind. More fascism, stability. I always found this little image here very, very weird. C, 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 C. Oh my goodness, so very weird. We still can't do anything here. Dalla Chiesa requests emergency powers. The Italian Middle East has often been described as a power to kick ethnic and religious divides, an increasingly precarious house of cards balanced between three major religions and several heavily armed militias. In response to the increasing tension in the region, Governor General Dalla Chiesa has sent the Italian government a request for sweeping emergency powers to keep his peace. This will include the power to conduct civil trials and rules by decree. Under a more ambitious general, this might be a cause for alarm. However, Dalla Chiesa is generally known as a conciliatory man and loath to resort to such drastic strong arm tactics. If someone like him asks for emergency powers, we can safely assume that the, situa the situation in the region is dire enough to warrant them. Oh man, we need so many guns to help these guys out. I don't like this. I really don't. It's looking a little better. I don't want to lower this, but we'll do it anyways. Because we can't do anything. I mean, we might still win the great game, but... Making Tyrant, Levant, a commitment to the Levant. Well... Hmm, French state, the Hellenic state... Uh, more power, whatever. This could really backfire on us, and it probably will, but... Scorza argues for stability of the Empire. Siano's sidelining within the NFP is becoming ever more apparent as he was forced to leave the floor to Carlos Scorza once again. With austere words, strong gestures, and burning eyes, he delivered a speech reminiscent of those of Cato Major in ancient Rome. Italy is burning with a historical destiny of ruling over the Mediterranean. This empire that embraces three continents can only be ruled by one thing alone, strength. And to show strength is what we need. More soldiers, larger ships, better weapons, all are needed to keep the Empire safe. Applause and cheers follow the speech, with Siano even finding himself forced to timidly clap. As Scorza his appeal to strength and military power is silent Siano's democratizing ideas. Many wonder what the implications of this renewed policy of militarism will mean for Italy's numerous subjects, but the more keen-eyed and political observers have predicted that it's only a matter of time before Carlos Scorza, the pretender, makes his move against Mussolini's heir. Anoe. Noe? Noe. 40 years of fascism? Go 
Giovinazzo. Huh. In 40 years, Italy has gone far from a nation threatened by poverty and Bolshevism to a glorious victory in the World War, from a weak country almost destroyed by the First World War into one of the globe's major powers, for better or for worse, fascism has tr transformed our nation, turning it into what it is now. The names of Mussolini and the great other men of this regime will forever be consigned to history books as the creators and leaders of this brave new era. However, fascism's legacy is complicated, and while some feel that the conquest of the fascist revolution has not gone far enough in creating new order, many more believe that the fascist era has entered its final years. None can tell this for 40th anniversary of, of the of the March on Rome marks the beginning of the end, or merely the end of the beginning. Ah, I can't wait. Siano and Siano. Siano's got a lot of support. And National Socialist Farnacci. 40 years, that's how long it takes to build an empire. 40 years, that's how long it takes for a nation to turn from a second-tiered country into a global power spanning over three continents, and including several nations under her protective watch. The Italian eagle spread her wings over the Mediterranean and risen over her enemies, defeating the British lion and reclaiming its Roman heritage. Troops parder, paraded in Rome to celebrate the start of this ascent to imperial glory, the march on Rome taking place in 1922, exactly 40 years ago. Men of the MVS and paraded along the Forae Imperiali, Painting the Roman streets black with their uniforms, tanks of the Regio Esercito rolled into the streets. Demonstrations of the might of the new legions, the Regia Marina, paraded with Junior Valerio Borghis, or Beligis, uh, or whatever how you pronounce it, and the Xmas in its head, or Christmas in its head. As the crowds cheered the hero of Gibraltar and Alexandria. Finally, the Arab. Aerobatic team of the Regia Aeronautica, the Freccia Tricolori, painted the skies of Rome green, white, red, as the people below looked in awe. And it was after it was all done, one by one, the families who came to see the soldiers parade all went home. The fanfare ended, the politicians left the stage, and the troops returned to the barracks. Silence returned in the skies of Rome as the moon illuminated the now empty Fora Imperoli in the Colosseum. Or the Colosseum. Colosseum. A night of display is always reassuring, but sometimes it hides the true reality of things. With dissent spreading among the population, violent divisions emerging in the PNF, and the colonial empire becoming more and more unstable and troubled, the future of Italy and all of Europe hangs in the balance. In the middle of the night, one man is still awake in Palazzo Chigi. A pile of documents sits on the Duce's desk, reports from ever more worried colonial governors, letters from the members of the PNF obliquely criticizing him, and communiques from foreign leaders slathered in empty praises and vague words. However, in the silence of the night, Siano is reading something else, a novel titled The Leopard, published a few years ago by a Sicilian author, and one quote strikes him particularly. Things change so that they can stay the same. Prepare the, for the Malta Conference. The Mediterranean is ours, see, mare nostrum. At least that's what fascist propaganda tells people. I'd always... The reality is a bit more complicated than that. Our relationship with other major nations in the area has been regulated by the accord and treaties set up together with the so-called triumvirate, an alliance reuniting the three major nations of the region, Italy, Iberia, and Turkey. However, increasing issues over different spheres of influence in Algeria, the Middle East, and other such problematic or problems are threatening the alliance's stability. A conference in Malta, the center of the Mediterranean Sea, will undoubtedly reinforce the bonds between us and our loyal allies. Oh, we get infrastructure in Friuli. I like that. Well, they can't do anything either, so I'm actually content with that. Is there anything else we can do? Probably not. Yeah, not much. Optimization, huh? Is it optimization worth it? Maybe we should change the current leader. Hmm. And we don't have enough political power to do that either, so... And with this part of the focus, we shall finish it with send out the invitation. La Valletta. Reclaimed in World War II from the British, who were squatting there since Napoleon's times and finally returned, reunited with Italy, has never looked as beautiful as it does now. The flags of Iberia, Italy, Turkey, and the smaller nations of the Triumvirate wave in the wind, and oh, the hot Mediterranean sun kisses the rooftops and bell towers of the city as ships come and go from its harbor. The only thing left to do now is to send out the formal invitation to the politicians, diplomats, and dignitaries that will arrive from all over the Mediterranean to convene in Malta, where hopefully a future of peace and shared prosperity for all of our nations can be built. Hopefully we can keep it unified. Totally keep it unified. This this beginning is reminding me of when I played the Empire of Japan, where there's a lot of reading, but not nearly as much as Japan. Japan has a bunch of reading. Tons of reading. I don't think I got to even that the first... Maybe I got through the first month of Japan? I can't remember, but the Malta Conference. The triumvirate teeters on the edge of collapse, and every power knows it. Border disputes that have existed for decades have been elevated to skirmishes, and its land borders have been created with the creation of Alantropa. Trade is in shambles, the economy is spiraling down, and nobody wants to get along with each other. Sounds like modern politics. In one final attempt to save the triumvirate, Siano has decided on calling a meeting. If he does not want to do the impossible, 
and pull the alliance from the ashes, then perhaps you will at least end it peacefully. Of course, the location of the conference on the scale of this one is of paramount importance. The Duce Siano held a private meeting with his adversary and party, Secretary Scorza. This would have to be a mutual agreement. He would not have his own party spoiling the festivities by making a stink back home or whatever unlikely place was chosen for the conference. The question still remained, though. Where would it be held? Rome wouldn't do, as the two other powers would already attack Italy for seeing as the center of the alliance. Nor would Madrid or Ankara. Siano would not give Franco Salazar the Turks the liberty of having some home ground, nor would he allow themselves to be seen at the center of the triumvirate. As he sat on the couch, drinking a glass of wine, he absentmindedly checked the label deep in thought. Maltese wine, his favorite? Wait, Malta. It was perfect on the home turf, but not ob obnoxiously so. Rich, stable, most importantly, no border disputes. There was a Mediterranean out of every window, glistening through everything it had survived. Delicious food, an ethnically diverse population that managed to coexist, a perfect example. Scorza wouldn't like it, of course, but that was a moot point. Scorza wanted to show off the pride of fascism. Rome. Or Roma. I'm a pragmatist, he thought to himself proudly. The illustrious Auberge de Castile in Malta had been chosen and prepared as a site for the upcoming conference. It was Siano's favorite place to rest wherever he departed to Malta. Sure, his counterparts in Iberia and Turkey would be swept in the extravagance of the hotel, right? Send them. Any national? No? No, oh, still here. I wonder what's going to happen at the conference. Hopefully, it's nothing but good things and good times. You know, good things, good people, good times. Live, laugh, love. Whatever it is. 55 naval XP, not too bad. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, roughly one a day. That's pretty darn good. And, oh, we should be getting done with prepared readouts just in case, because you never know what could happen down here in the <clears throat> Levant. Siano gives the opening speech. Over the past few days, a delegates from around the Triumvirate have arrived. Tensions are high, and many attendees aren't exactly sure what the purpose of the conference is. Those questions, however, are set to be answered as Duce Galezzo Siano takes the stage. Honored delegates, he begins, we have gathered here today to put aside our differences and reaffirm the greatness of our alliance. I know many of you have disputes and issues to raise, and this is the place to do it. Many in the audience are shocked by the bluntness of his words, but there are a few smiles. At least he recognizes that this is going to be a complete crap show, murmurs one trick ship to another. The triumvirate was forged in fire, Siano continues, and as the world falls back into chaos, we must be open and frank with one another, if our alliance is to survive. We are like brothers, squabbling sometimes, but always united in purpose and bound by familial love and common history. Siano finished. I now invite my brother from Turkey to take the siege. Welcome, all. Oh, we have 25 political power. Can we do anything here? Not too much. They're still at 6, so... Even if we did this, there's a 25% chance we would lose, and they're not doing anything, so I'm not going to spend my political power with that. Uh, fire the current leader, establish connections now. Constructing civilian factories? Wait, hold on, what's going on with... Cons make contact with the fatherland. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay, cool. We get another civilian factory, Turkish speech. As Siano steps down from the stage, the Turkish Basbug, uh, Alparslan, Al Turkes, walks forward, and while the Turkish delegation responds with raucous applause, the rest of the delegation is rather muted. I will not bore you with bland pleasantries like the Duce. Turkish ha halting Italians, overcome by the directness of his words. Siano is right in one regard when he brings up our shared history. We have a history of disputed borders, he roars. The Turkish delegation responds with shouts and cheers, while the rest of the conference looks on sullenly. Many expected such a response, but few were prepared for the directness of Basbug's words. And obviously, I'm saying all their names wrong. I'm not opposed to the triumvirate in and of itself, Turkus continues. The collective security it offers is a blessing in its tumultuous world, but if Turkey is to continue to remain a member, we must have our ancestral lands back. We are fed up with the European domination of our sphere of influence. I look forward to meeting with the leaders of our alliance to discuss our disputed claims and their return to the rightful motherland, Turkey. The Turkish delegation practically leaped from the seat, slamming their feet on the ground and cheering. Quite worrisome, if you're Italian. And or Iberian. Ah, good. Spend more on construction. Build, build, build. Army reserve training just in case. You never know if you might need that. And Franco and Salazar speeches. After that disaster disastrously inflammatory speech, it was time for the two Caudillos of Iberia to take charge or take the stage. The two walked together, rubbing shoulders in their attempts to follow formal protocol. Salazar spoke first. Honored leaders, he began, we wish to see the triumvirate remain united just like our friend and ally, Basbuk Turkis. And just like him, we have the disputes of our own to solve the problem. Uh, Franco picked up from here. However, unlike him, we will not resort to threats and nationalist agitation. We truly seek an equal agreement for all parties of the triumvirate. This was met by jeers and heckling from some of the audience. We are all equal partners in this great alliance. Remember, for whatever reason you are here, there is one issue more important than all the rest. The preservation of our Mediterranean Brotherhood, one and united. The two awkwardly took turns speaking for half an hour, and then while they were met with applied applause from the audience, a fair few had dozed off by the time they finished. When is this going to end? I don't know, but I like getting more political power. Ooh. What is that? ITA.1000.3? Oh.
Oh, do we build it? Oh, of course, the Levantine Chaos. The Holy Land was hardly tranquil in the best of times, and it's quite clear that these are not the best of times. Violence between Jewish, paramilitaries, and Arab nationals have intensified in recent months, with a number of violent incidents on the rise. The garrison struggles to keep the peace as the local population clashes with both each other and the Italian army. The administration is under increasing pressure to contain the situation, with demands and requests coming directly from the colonial office. Immediate action must be taken to rectify the situation and restore order to the Levant before things get out of hand. We have an obligation to protect the Empire. Um, oh, so now we're at 3 and they're at 7. Okay, so we can at least do this, which wouldn't help us at all. We lose army XP, support equipment, and political power. I think I want to save it for that one. Um, you know what? Actually, with this one, Sour Relations? Well, that's okay. Let's do it immediately. Anything else? Fire the current leader, of course. I want to get more oil. Opening the Canal Conference. A major point of contention among the delegates of the Suez Canal transferred to the Italian control following their victory in Egypt. They have held sole authority over the transit in the canal since then, forcing other triumvirate members to pay dues just like any other country outside the alliance. Liberia especially has long wanted access to the canal as they lack the grounds presence of Turkey in the region. Italian and Iberian delegates with observers from the other triumvirate member nations have gathered in an Vale room ballroom to discuss access to the, to the canal. Let us begin. So, fire the current leader. Yeah, there's nothing else we can do right now, so. Just keep an eye on the great game. Hopefully, they get up to 10. Or, I mean, 11. 11 or above. Iberian demands in the first negotiating session. Iberian diplomat Ferdinand Maria Castilla Yimais demanded Iberia have equal access to the canal. Deliberations continued for hours until finally the Spaniard slammed his hand on the table. You've held the canal for too darn long, he yelled. Why the heck should we, your ally, be forced to pay to use it? We'll even give you a one-time lump sum of money, of aid money, if you give us unlimited access. That's my final offer. You can take it or leave it. Maybe you can become ridiculous. You refuse that right? You know what? That's not a bad idea. I mean, we're fascists. I probably shouldn't be too nice, but, you know, maybe... Okay, sure. Why not? Why not? Point nine two, huh? Not enough. Oh, oh! Look at that. Eight and eight. That's ooh. Uh, over here they have two. They have two to four, huh? Siano attempts to negotiate, or maybe not. So Siano replies, "Gentlemen, let us be civil here. I'm not sure if we're willing to take that trade. Perhaps we can come to another agreement." The Iberian delegation nodded warily. Siano and other Italian delegates quickly leave the room, whispering quietly while the Iberians deliberate among themselves. Let's see how this goes. I'm not opposed to some reforms. Fascism is all about reforms, right? Right? So, we have a 50% chance of getting 9 or 10, but a pretty high chance to lose it, so... I don't mind tying it, because I'm pretty sure we won the first round, right? Yeah, we... No, the Germans won. Oh, no, no, the Germans are on the left side. Oh, right? Oh, that's my fault. The Germans are on the left side. I'm so used to seeing on the left side after, after I play as a... Uh, Germany. They rejoin a few hours later. What about Algeria? Castilla a Miles Broaches will take it and that little insurrection off your hands if we just forget this whole dispute. Your colonial forces are overextended and you know it. Oh, the Croatian. Oh, boy. The Republic of Yugoslavia? No commies here. No, 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 no. What will the future bring? A lot of death. And chaos. I'm gonna go with logistics wizard and offensive doctrine. Civil rights act of 1962. Alrighty, we're ready to go. We're ready to have a good time. Ooh, oh, they're ten. Wait, oh, we can't do anything about that. God dang it! Oh, we're probably gonna lose Bulgaria then. Whatever. Mongolian civil war. God dang it! What do we lose at political power? Su Suez sunrises. Another day, another shift for the many soldiers and sailors stationed in the many military installations in the Suez. This Egyptian sun is as ruthless as it always was, but in recent times something has changed. Indeed, more and more ships pass through the canal with each passing day. Japan, India, China, Australia, Thailand. Suez is turning more and more into a true babble of languages and races, all passing through under the watchful eye of the Regia Marina. Since the creation of Alan Thoropa, Suez became the jugular vein of the Italian Empire, the one passage that connects the Mediterranean with the rest of the world's waters. Italy's monopoly over its is a vital asset for the Empire, and this would be no surprise that the place is one of the most heavily fortified regions in the world, dotted with military installations, bunkers, outposts, and fortifications. Losing Suez is synonymous with losing the Empire, and everyone is of, of some importance in Italy's government knows that perfectly. The fate of our country rests on a canal? Umberto holds a banquet. Our King Umberto II has held a banquet today. He's invited the many nobles still all around Italy, however, quite worryingly, as many of the top brass of the military are invited. While this apparently is just a formal occasion, many people are speculating that Umberto meeting with the military is a sign of greater aspirations. Not like a fear, I can do much, though. 
Sierra refuses again. Sierra fires back. Ridiculous. We've trusted you for 20 years, and this is how you repay us? Trying to steal our territory that we fought for and bled for? Of course not. These negotiations are over. The Iberian delegates, shocked, reply. This is outrageous. We expect to be treated as equals, not children. They continued by claiming that they would not participate on later discussions over territorial disputes and concluded with a scathing attack on Siano. We joined you decades ago because you promised equality and freedom from tyranny, but now you're no better than the Germans, lording over us like some petty Rex Commissariat. We're done with this conference. Not surprising. Oh, man. I should use my political power when we had it. Project being decided, huh? Survey for a project? 10% chance? Okay, not bad. Uh, surveying? I guess we do that too. Doesn't look like it's doing too much. Keep finding the project. God dang it. So we're probably going to lose Bulgaria. That's my bad. I thought we were on the left side. I'm so used to it. I'm coming literally... At the time of this recording, I'm coming off of my campaign playing as uh, Germany, Bormans Germany, so... My bad, Iberia won't attend our board of conference. True to the word, the Iberian delegates were nowhere to be seen this morning as the various dignitaries took their seats for the board of conference. The Turkish diplomats looked relieved while Italian delegates shared worries, worried glances. Sino feared the conference was collapsing around him. More for us, then. Has Burgundy finally done it? God help us all. Very much so. Eight and ten. Come on, man. Fire the test our work. What happens if we test our work? The start of the border conference. By and far the largest conflict present in the triumvirate are the many border disputes that have sparked up in the triumvirate between all three members. For this problem to be resolved, there will be two full days dedicated to negotiating over the nature of these disputed territories. The event started with a noticeable lack of Iberian diplomats, as they informed their hosts that they refused to attend it beforehand, as they're holier than all of us. The Basberg al Pasan Turkes took the podium with an oversized chart of the Eastern Mediterranean following behind him. Among the rest of the entourage, he began explaining the convoluted ancient importance of Cyprus and roads to Turkey, and the demographics of the islands, particularly what Turkish called the overwhelming majority of ethnic pure Turks. The Italian controlled islands of Rhodes and Cyprus have long been a thorn in Turkey's side, due to in part to the large minority of Turks, but also more importantly because of their vital strategic importance, serving as inlets into the Aegean and the Mediterranean. Eastern Mediterranean. Furthermore, since the completion of Atlantropa, several of these islands, or Italian islands, have gained prominent land borders with the Turkish mainland. As the triumvirate deteriorates, and with the Italo Turkish relationship becoming one of thinly veiled threats and backhand slaps instead of friends and allies, Turkish has become a much more vocal regarding the issue of these rightfully Turkish lands being denied union with the Turkish state. Our demands are clear. We only ask for what has been ours for millennia, were the words of Turkish on the proposed concessions. We will not back down, we won't fall, and we will not stop until we have it. A reminder on what action Turkey will surely take should their demands be refused. Um. Hmm. Now that's a big Cyprus, holy cow. That's a big old Cyprus. Demands is Greco-Turkish, which sounds like a problem. And Greek. Oh wow, we have a lot of areas here too. Well, I, I'm gonna say no for this campaign since we're gonna go more fascist. You too, our answer is no. When I play as Italy again and going more democratic, then we'll probably be a lot more open to reform and stuff like that. If you guys can remind me, because I'm, I'm, I might remember, I might not. Like, I play so many campaigns, I can't remember a lot of things anymore. My mind is slipping. I'm becoming an old man. Oh no. 1962. Well, let's make sure our guns are adequate, right? Hey, but the debt's doing quite a bit better. Even though it looks like our GDP is slowly going down. 78.59. And Siano refuses to negotiate. Siano shakes his head. We will not be bullied into giving up land, he solemnly says. We need to control these islands as bases. We're more than willing to give you joint control over the base. Turkus cuts him off. Dude, I knew it was a mistake coming here. You just want to continue your domination of the Mediterranean using us as pawns. I'm through with your empty promises. Predictable. Look, man, if you want something else, I don't know. Tear the Holy Land, though. A hand shaking, a wire turned and folded, a clock wound three times and released. The ticking of the clock danced in the air, in the ear, and in the heart. It was everywhere, unseen and untasted. But permanent like the still morning dawn, the ticking was rapid, now terrified. It was too fast, too rapid, too terribly erratic and horribly bent in the wrong vector. The clock couldn't stop, it didn't want to stop. It needed to end the ticking and end the torturous bangs and sharp clicks, downwards into a spiral pulled up by heaven's sword and glory. Tick, tick, tick. The explosion rocked the governor's palace. Screams and shouts boiled up, uh, upwards. Dallas Chiazia, so incredibly fortunate, was frightened nonetheless. Terrors gripped the Levant so, and will only grow stronger by the day. We need boots on the grounds yesterday. Actually, you know, uh, is this the best place to put them? Because, wh why? Are, hold on, why are you all over there? Just in case. A meeting in St. Julian's. Oh boy. The bass bug sat in his chair, leaning back, taking a heavy sip of his wine. 
You know, as well as me, Franco. Siano's not folding to either of our terms. Nothing penetrating that thick skull of his. All we have to do is show him we can cooperate. I'm telling you, this is how we can get to him. Franco looked disinterested, turning his gaze to the Mediterranean. Really? And what do you suggest we cooperate on? We aren't prone to working together, if you haven't noticed. Franco looked disinterested, but... Uh, and turned his gaze to the Mediterranean. Really? Oh. Oh, my bad. Stazar attempted to butt in, but took his spoke before he could. Just open up a border conflict. You don't have to commit much. It won't be a large, I assure you. Help me out on this one, or I'll guarantee you I will not have your back when the regime collapses. Um, that had gained Franco's attention. All right. I'll talk to some of my generals on it. I can't guarantee any... No, you can't guarantee anything? Now without my permission. Franco was beginning to get frustrated with his Portuguese friend, but he couldn't crack under his pressure. You're right. Do you agree to this proposal, Salazar? Yes, let us call the generals. The secret meeting became public knowledge, though each leader refused to comment on the specifics. If there's one thing that the Triumvirate could have cooperated on, it was killing each other. Backstabbing traitors. And we might as well do this to see what happens. There's, we have to take at least a good chance to get up to 10. Because if we don't do it, we're going to lose anyways. What do we have here? Tesser work? Um, it seems like there's nothing bad about testing it. I thought it was 16%. Well, let's try. Optimization. Bosnian partisans affirm their loyalty. A curious message has reached the desk of Duce Siano in Rome this morning. It's come at priority speed from the region of Bosnia. You have territory in the Kingdom of Croatia. That is to say, it was a territory of the former Kingdom of Croatia. It seems that, as the latter of these two entities has fallen victim to a communist coup, the former has taken the opportunity to declare itself independent. Uh, the provisional government in Sarajevo has been established by one Elijah Izet Begovic, and has claimed control of roughly half the former of King's Kingdom's territory. Of course, the partisans are also no, under no delusion that Tito will simply allow them to exist within his spirit with a ticking time bomb, and therefore declared the continued loyalty to the Empire, King Umberto, and Duce Siano. The tensions with this new Red Yugoslavia were already building, but this declaration seems to make war inevitable. Still, it seems better to go into battle with an ally in the enemy's camp than by oneself to our new partners in Bosnia. Oh, look at that. Bosnia. Hello, Bosnia. Well, hopefully we can do well here. The Malta Conference has been bombed. The first reports reached Rome were sporadic and disjointed. A fire had broken out in the city of Burgu. The Turks were prepared to trap and invade Malta. The Krieg's Marine were shelling the Fort St. Angelo. Someone had tried to shoot El Duce. Attempts to verify anything were unsuccessful. At the phone lines of the conference were all, sight were all down. Some tried to formulate all this into a single narrative, but it was so self-contradictory that it was all fruitless. Anyone could do was wait and pray for good news. Thankfully, it was a wait of only several minutes before it was confirmed that the Duce was alive and we were returning to Rome post haste. The clear details also begin to trickle in. A bomb went off in Fort St. Angelo, obliterating the conference room, and both the Bathsburg and the Caldillo survived unscathed due to good timing. The identity of the bombers are known, but if it was done by any of the Triumvirate's other member states, it was unlikely that they would take responsibility. Some in Rome have already begun pointing fingers at Iberia and Turkey, and they are undoubtedly those who accuse us. While tensions were high going into the meeting, they now are absolutely astronomical. If the bomber's goal was to sow chaos in the Mediterranean, then he had succeeded beyond his wildest dreams, just when it couldn't get any worse. How sad. Now, I'm, I'm kind of just waiting here so that we can get at least another focus, but we'll see what happens. Come on, root for 10, 10, 10. Come on. Oh, come on, 12. Oh, oh. But Iberia and Turkey blame Italy withdraw de delegates. So unsurprisingly, out of all the members of the Triumvirate, nobody's willing to take responsibility for the bombings. Who would? Although Italy claims they had nothing to do with the bombings, as they had zero incentive to do this, this does not stop Iberia and Turkey blaming the Italians for the whole fiasco. Both Iberia and Turkey have, have withdrawn their delegates from the conference, stating that it's clear that they are not safe for them to be there. No. Wait, wait, don't leave, no. Leave, then, if you must. Don't mind me, I'm just increasing the amount of civilian factories we can produce. Ah, uh, three lines. Three full lines to civilian factories. Ah, uh, that makes me so happy. Not bad. Death of the Triumvirate from a very uh, secure, undisclosed location in Rome. Duce Siano has announced that with a heavy heart on national TV that the mutual bonds of the Triumvirate's member states are to be dissolved, effective immediately. While he emphasized how much it was his idea and its success at deterring German warmongering, it's painfully clear that the alliance would not have been long for this world, even without the bombing. It was the inevitable outcome for a union of nations with proud leaders, opposing goals, and competing spheres of influence. No doubt that the news is being met with a acrimonious agreement in Madrid and Ankara, a mix of happiness that they are finally free and annoyance that they are denied the opportunity to dramatically quit first. But the threat of Germany still looms large in the minds of many, and there may be an hour of need where the Triumvirate will be sorely missed, but that hour is still far away, and few will mourn the Triumvirate's passing tonight. You break my heart. You break, break my heart, everyone. We don't even have our own faction. Wow, all these, everyone's here is the I-9's I didn't realize that even the French state is. I did not realize that. But it is June. Or July 6th. Oh, we have a focus. Oh, finally, focus. Uh, is this all we have? I guess it's all we have. Is that the economy? Or the realities of our situation? Defense plan. Reinforce the fourth. Sure. Build up Sardinia. Desert wings. I kind of like that. Defense plan. Cadorna. Winter plans, huh? That's very similar. More, ooh. 
Division attack, I like that. I like that a lot. Defense bonds, Kaneva. Um, it seems okay. It seems kind of lacking. Oh, minus 20%. Jesus Christ, that's a lot. You know what? I will let you guys decide what we should do. Should we do Defense Plan Campioni, Defense Plan Cadorno, or Defense Plan Caniva? But we're going to do the status of the economy first and conclude this episode. The Italian economy has, since Atlanthropa, never been incredibly stable. The receding waters ruin our former port cities, and the only trade with our triumvirate allies allowed the Italian economy to remain afloat. However, with the collapse of the triumvirate, we are left in a pr very precarious situation. Thankfully, all is not lost. With the Mediterranean waters having finished receding, the new port cities will not become obsolete in a matter of years. Furthermore, with Italy's expanding industry and control over major trade routes, such as the Suez Canal, we can build up our economy so that the loss of Iberia and Turkey as trading partners will not be the economic death blow that our enemies wish it to be. But regardless, thank you very much for watching this longish video. If you liked it, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we shall probably go to war with a few authoritarian socialists. Thanks for watching, and have a tremendous Italian rest of your day.